Board of Directors of the National Book Foundation is extremely honored to present you with the Distinguished Contribution of American Letters Award for this year, 2003. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you for the applause and thank you for coming. I'm delighted to be here, but as I've said before in the last five years, I'm delighted to be anywhere. Um, and this isn't in my speech, so don't take it out of my allotted time. There are some people who've spoken out passionately about giving me this medal. There are some people who think it's an extraordinarily bad idea. There have been some people who've spoken out who think that it's an extraordinarily good idea. Um, you know who you are and where you stand, and most of you who are here tonight are on my side. I'm, I'm glad for that. But I want to say it doesn't matter, in a sense, which side you are on. The people who speak out, speak out because they are passionate about the book, about the word, about the page. And in that sense, we're all brothers and sisters. Give yourself a hand. Thanks. Now, as for my <clears throat> remarks, structure for Wednesday. Oh, that's the agenda. The only person who understands how much this award means to me is my wife, Tabitha. I was a writer when I met her in 1967, but my only venue was the campus newspaper where I published a rude weekly column. It turned me into a bit of a celebrity, but I was a poor one, scraping through college thanks to a jury-rigged package of loans and scholarships. A friend of Tabitha Spruce pointed me out to her one winter day as I crossed the mall in my jeans and cut down green rubber boots. I had a bushy black beard, I hadn't had my car hair cut in two years, and I looked like Charlie Manson. <laughs> my wife-to-be clasped her hands between her breasts and said, I think I'm in love, <laughs> in a tone dripping with sarcasm. Tabby Spruce had no more money than I did, but in sarcasm, she was loaded. <laughs> when we married in 1971, we already had one child. By the middle of 1972, we had a pair. I taught school and worked in a laundry during the summer. Tabby worked for Dunkin' Donuts. When she was working, I took care of the kids. When I was working, it was vice versa. And writing was always an undisputed part of that work. Tabby finished the first book of our marriage, a slim but wonderful book of poetry called Grimoire. This is a very atypical audience, one passionately dedicated to books and to the word. Most of the world, however, sees writing as a fairly useless occupation. I've even heard it called mental masturbation, once or twice by people in my family. <laughs> I never heard that from my wife. She'd read my stuff and felt certain I'd someday support us by writing full-time instead of standing in front of a blackboard and spouting on about Jack London and Ogden Nash. She never made a big deal of this. It was just a fact of our lives. We lived in a trailer, and she made a writing space for me in the tiny laundry room with the desk and her Olivetti portable between the washer and dryer. She still tells people that I married her for that typewriter. But that's only partly true. I married her because I loved her and because we got on as well out of bed as in it. The typewriter was a factor, though. <laughs> when I gave up on Carrie, it was Tabby who rescued the first few pages of single-spaced uh, manuscript from the wastebasket. Told me it was good, said I ought to go on. When I told her I didn't know how to go on, she helped me out with the girls' locker room stuff. There were no inspiring speeches. Tabby does sarcasm. Tabby doesn't do inspiration. Never has. It was just, this is pretty good. You ought to keep it going. 
That was all I needed, and she knew it. There were some hard, dark years before Carrie. We had two kids and no money. We rotated the bills, paying on different ones each month. I kept our car, an old Buick, going with duct tape and bailing wire. It was a time when my wife might have been expected to say, why don't you quit spending three hours a night in the laundry room, Steve, smoking cigarettes and drinking beer we can't afford? Why don't you get an actual job? Okay, this is the real stuff. <laughs> if she'd asked, I almost certainly would have done it. And then am I standing up here tonight, making a speech, accepting the award, wearing a radar dish around my neck? <laughs> Maybe, more likely not. In fact, the subject of moonlighting did come up once. The head of the English department where I taught told me that the debate club was going to need a new faculty advisor, and he put me up for the job if I wanted. It would pay $300 per school year, which doesn't sound like much, but my yearly take in 1973 was only $6,600, and $300 equaled 10 weeks' worth of groceries. The English department head told me he'd need my decision by the end of the week. When I told Tabby about the opening, she asked if I'd still have time to write. I told her not as much. Her response to that was unequivocal. Well then, you can't take it. One of the few times during the early years of our marriage when I saw my wife cry really hard was when I told her that a paperback publisher, New American Library, had paid a ton of money for the book she'd rescued from the trash. I could quit teaching. She could quit pushing crullers at Dunkin' Donuts. She looked almost unbelieving for five seconds, and then she put her hands over her face, and she wept. When she finally stopped, we went into the living room and sat on our old couch, which Tabby had rescued from a yard sale, and talked into the early hours of the morning about what we were going to do with the money. I've never had a more pleasant conversation. <laughs> I have never had one that felt more surreal. My point is that Tabby always knew what I was supposed to be doing, and she believed that I would succeed at it. There is a time in the lives of most writers when they are vulnerable, when the vivid dreams and ambitions of childhood seem to pale in the harsh sunlight of what we call the real world. In short, there's a time when things can go either way. That vulnerable time for me came during 1971 to 1973. If my wife had suggested to me, even if with love and kindness and gentleness, rather than her more common wit and good-natured sarcasm, that the time had come to put my dreams away and support my family, I would have done that with no complaint. I believe that on some level of thought, I was expecting to have that conversation. If she had suggested that you can't buy a loaf of bread or a tube of toothpaste, with rejection slips, I would have gone out and found a part-time job. Tabby has told me since that it never crossed her mind to have such a conversation. You had a second job, she said, in the laundry room with my typewriter. I hope you know, Tabby, that they're clapping for you and not for me. Stand up so they can see you, please. Thank you. Thank you. I did not let her see this speech, and I will hear about this later. Now, there are lots of people that will tell you that anyone who writes genre fiction or any kind of fiction that tells a story is in it for the money and nothing else. It's a lie. The idea that all storytellers are in it for the money is untrue, but it's still hurtful, it's infuriating, and it's demeaning. I never in my life wrote a single word for money. As badly as we needed money, I never wrote for money. From those early days to this gala black tie night, I never once sat down at my desk thinking, today I'm gonna make a hundred grand, 
or this story will make a great movie. If I had tried to write with those things in mind, I believe I would have sold my birthright for a plot of message, as the old pun has it. Either way, Tabby and I would still be living in a trailer or an equivalent abode. My wife knows the importance of this award isn't the recognition of being a great writer or even a good writer, but the recognition of being an honest writer. Frank Norris, the author. <laughs> Frank Norris, the author of McTeague, said something like this. What should I care if they, i.e. the critics, single me out for sneers and laughter? I never truckled. I never lied. I told the truth. And that's always been the bottom line for me. The story and the people in it made me make believe. But I need to ask myself over and over if I've told the truth about the way real people would behave in a similar situation. Of course, I only have my own senses, experiences, and reading to draw on. But that usually, not always, but usually, usually it's enough. It gets the job done. For instance, if an elevator full of people, one of the ones in this very building, I want you to think about this later. <laughs> I want you to think about it. If it starts to vibrate, and you hear those clanks, this probably won't happen, but we all know it has happened. <laughs> it could happen. It could happen to me or it could happen to you. Someone always wins the lottery. Just put it away for now until you go up to your rooms later. Uh, anyway, if an elevator full of people starts free falling from the 35th floor of a skyscraper all the way to the bottom, one of those view elevators perhaps where you can watch it happening. <laughs> in my opinion, no one is going to say, goodbye, Neil, I will see you in heaven. In my book or my short story, they're far more apt to bellow, oh, shit, at the top of their lungs because what I've read and heard tends to confirm the oh, shit choice. If that makes me a cynic, so be it. I remember a story on the nightly news about an airliner that crashed, killing all aboard. The so-called black box was recovered, and we have the pilot's immortal last four words, son of a bitch. <laughs> of course, there was another plane that crashed in the black box recorder said, goodbye, mother, which is a nicer way to go out, I think. <laughs> Folks are far more apt to go out with a surprised ejaculation, however, uh, than an expiring abjuration like, marry her, Jake. Bible says it ain't good for a man to be alone. <sighs> if I happen to be the writer of such a deathbed scene, I'd choose son of a bitch over marry her, Jake, every time. We understand that fiction is a lie to begin with. To ignore the truth inside the lie is to sin against the craft in general and one's own work in particular. I'm sure I've made the wrong choices from time to time. Doesn't the Bible say something like, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of Chaucer? But every time, that's it, thanks babe. But every time I did it, I was sorry. Sorry's cheap though. I had revised the lie out if I could, and that's far more important. When readers are deeply entranced by a story, they forget the storyteller completely. The tale is all they care about. But the storyteller cannot afford to forget and must always be ready to hold himself or herself to account. He or she needs to remember that the truth lends verisimilitude to the lies that surround it. If you tell your reader, sometimes chickens will pick out the weakest one in the flock and peck it to death, the truth, the reader is much more apt to go along with you if you then add something like, such chickens often melt into the earth after their deaths. How stringently the writer holds to the truth inside the lie is one of the ways that he can judge how seriously he takes his craft. My wife, who doesn't seem to know how to tell a lie, even in a social context where people routinely say things like, you look wonderful, have you lost weight? <laughs> has always understood these things without needing to have them spelled out. She's what the Bible calls a pearl beyond price. 
She also understands why I was, in those early days, so often bitterly angry at writers who were considered literary. I knew I didn't have quite enough talent or polish to be one of them, so there was an element of jealousy, but I was also infuriated by how these writers always seemed to have the inside track, in my view at that time. Even a note on the acknowledgments page of a novel thanking the This or That Foundation for its generous assistance was enough to set me off. I knew what it meant, I told my wife. It was the old boy network at work. It was this, it was that, on and on and blah, blah, blah. It is only in retrospect that I realized how much I sounded like my least favorite uncle who believed there really was an international Jewish cabal running everything from the Ford Motor Company to the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Tabitha listened to a fair amount of this pissing and moaning and finally told me to stop with the breast beating. She said, to save my self-pity and turn my energy to the typewriter. She paused and then added, my typewriter. <laughs> I did because she was right and my anger played much better when channeled into about a dozen stories which I wrote in 1973 and early 1974. Not all of them were good, but most of them were honest and I realized an amazing thing. Readers of the men's magazines where I was publishing were remembering my name and starting to look for it. I could hardly believe it, but it appeared that people wanted to read what I was writing. There's never been a thrill in my life to equal that one. With Tabby's help, I was able to put aside my useless jealousy and get writing again. I sold more of my short stories. Uh, I sold Carrie, and the rest, as they say, is history. There's been a certain amount of grumbling about the decision to give the award to me, and since so much of this has been about my wife, I wanted to give you her opinion on the subject. She's read everything I've written, making her something of an expert, and her view of my work is loving, but unsentimental. Tabby says I deserve the medal, not just because some good movies were made from my stories, or because I provided high motivation reading material for slow learners, she says, I deserve the medal because I am a, quote, damn good writer. <laughs> I've, I've tried to improve myself with every book and find the truth inside the lie, and sometime I have succeeded. I salute the NBA committee who took a huge risk in giving this award to a man many people see as a rich hack. For far too long, the so-called popular writers of this country and the so-called literary writers have stared at each other with animosity and a willful lack of understanding. This is the way it has always been. Witness my childish resentment of anyone who ever got a Guggenheim. But giving an award like this to a guy like me suggests that in the future, things don't have to be the way they've always been. Bridges can be built between the so-called popular fiction and the so-called literary fiction. The first gainers in such a widening of interests would be the readers, of course, which is us, because writers are almost always readers and listeners first. You have been very good listeners, patient listeners, and I'm gonna let you go soon. <laughs> but I'd like to say one more thing before I do. Tokenism is not allowed. You can't sit back, give a self-satisfied sigh, and say, ah, that takes care of the troublesome pop lit question in another 20 years, or perhaps 30. I'll give this award to another writer who sells enough books to make the bestseller list. It's not good enough nor do I have any patience with or use for those who make a point of pride in saying they've never read anything by John Grisham, Tom Clancy, Mary Higgins Clark, or any other popular writer. What do you think? You get social academic brownie points for deliberately staying out of touch with your own culture? <laughs> Never in life, as Captain Lucky Jack Aubrey would say, and if your only point of reference for Jack Aubrey is the Australian actor Russell Crowe, shame on you. <laughs> There's a writer here tonight, my old friend and sometime collaborator, Peter Straub.
He's just published which may be the best book of his career. Lost Boy and Lost Girl surely deserves your consideration for the NBA shortlist next year, if not the award itself. Have you read it? Have any of the judges read it? There's another writer here tonight who writes under the name of Jack Ketchum, and he has also written what may be the best book of his career, a long novella called The Crossings. Have you read it? Have any of the judges read it? And yet, Jack Ketchum's first novel, Off Season, published in 1980, set off a furor in my supposed field, that of horror, that was unequaled until the advent of Clive Barker. It is not too much to say that these two gentlemen remade the face of American popular fiction, and yet very few people here will have an idea of who I'm talking about or have read the work. This is not criticism. It's just me pointing out a blind spot in the winnowing process and in the very act of reading the fiction of one's own culture, honoring me as a step in a different direction, a fruitful one, I think. I'm asking you, almost begging you, not to go back to the old way of doing things. There's a great deal of good stuff out there, and not all of it is being done by writers whose work is regularly reviewed in the Sunday New York Times review of books, book review. I believe the times come when you must be inclusive rather than exclusive. That said, that said, I accept this award on behalf of such disparate writers as Elmore Leonard, Peter Straub, Nora Lofts, Jack Ketchum, whose real name is Dallas Mayer, Jody Picoult, Greg Isles, John Grisham, Dennis Lehane, Michael Connolly, Pete Hamill, and a dozen more, a dozen more. I hope, I hope that the NBA writers, the judge, I mean the NBA judges, past, present, and future, will read these writers, and that the books will open their eyes to a whole new realm of American literature. You don't have to vote for them, just read them. Okay, thanks for bearing with me. Last page, last page. This is it. Parting is such sweet sorrow. My message is simple enough. We can build bridges between the popular and the literary if we keep our minds and hearts open. With my wife's help, I've tried to do that. Now I'm going to turn the actual award, the medal, over to her because she will make sure in all the excitement that it doesn't get lost. <laughs> in closing, I want to say that I hope you all find something good to read tonight or tomorrow. I want to salute all the nominees in the four categories that are up for consideration. And I do. I hope you'll find something to read that will fill you up as this evening has filled me up. Thank you.